Here we've got Deuces in the small blind. Spraggy, who's an avid Oasis fan, like he really loves him, opens a 20 in the hijack. The button calls, I call. Jeff Boski calls in the big blind. We're going four ways to the flop. It's 10-8 deuce with two hearts. We have bottom set against a couple of my favorite people in poker, Jeff Boski and little Gordon Ramsay. I check, Jeff checks, Spraggy loves pain. He bets 55. The button calls, there are lots of draws. I'm not gonna slow play this. I raise the 200. Jeff doesn't have anything to stick around with. He folds. Spraggy is a non-believer. He three bet rips it in for 864 effective, like some kind of mad villain in Doctor Who. The button folds. I call. I'm playing a huge all in for this game against one of my buddies, and I have no idea what he has. We're good. I like the bet on uh, Brad. The turn is the queen of spades, so queens and jack nine are now beating me. The river is the four of diamonds. We show Spraggy our hand, and the dude is not happy. What insane loser you have, actually? Aces are real, real, real. Kings. Oh, oh this feels so good. Put all his money in his one pair. I check raise and he just rips it. Does he have any cover? What's he got? It's always bittersweet to beat your buddy in a huge all-in situation. Obviously, I'm happy to win the pot, and I know Spraggy's happy for me to have a lot of his money. Plus, it's captured on video that'll be on YouTube forever, but Marley has left Spraggy here without a car by himself, and it got really uncomfortable when Spraggy told me that he might need to borrow money for a bus ride home. I had to tell him no. He's a really good friend, but he needs to learn some lessons the hard way, like not to get it in with one pair for 200 big blinds and multi-way pots. It'll be for his own good. To make things tougher, I got the sense that he didn't like having to watch me write notes about the hand in my phone, mostly because he tweeted about it. I can definitely understand how that would be annoying. If I just played a hand terribly and got stacked, I wouldn't want there to be any documentation of it either. It's just that I'm trying to make the vlog the best that it can be. I have to provide a lot of details, and sometimes when I'm writing all those details of the hand history, it takes a little while. I even put in hand history keys in my notes. It's a tough one for Spraggy. My advice to him is, you gotta roll with it, you know what I mean? Some might say, don't look back in anger. And I don't think that he did. Thanks, man. We're now down to playing five-handed. There's no straddle on, and Alex limps in from the cutoff with ace-10 offsuit. We've got pocket threes in the small blind. There's no real need to raise. I'm okay seeing a flop for a discount. I call for 100 more. Ivy checks his option. We're going three ways to the flop out of position. The dealer puts out 9-4-3 with two diamonds. We have bottom set in a pot where Ivy has top pair, but is drawing nearly dead. Sometimes I'll lead with weaker hands like gut shot straight draws on low boards and limped pots when I'm in small blind. Here, I've got the second best hand that I'll ever have. For balance, I make almost a pot size bet of 500. Ivy can't go anywhere with a nine in his hand. He's in trouble, but makes the call. Botez thinks that I might have some type of draw or that she'll at least have some turns that'll help her improve. She calls with ace high. It seems likely to me that one or both players has a drawing hand, especially since there aren't many threes left in the deck. The turn is the ten of spades. It's a great card in my mind and in Botez's, but it's actually a nightmare for Botez. There are even more straight draw possibilities now. I increase the sizing to more than a pot size bet of 2,500. Since this was a limped pot, it's not too large of a bet in relation to the game that we're playing. Both opponents are drawing completely dead. Ivy calls with the second best pair, even with Botez behind him. He must have put her on some type of draw. To his credit, she had nothing on the flop, and there's no real way for him to know that she'd connect with a 10. Alex calls as well. I'm rooting very hard for the board to pair or for a blank. If the river is non-diamond, ace, 10, or 9, I can possibly make a lot more money. Instead, the river is the jack of diamonds. Everyone has a hand with value and is drastically downgraded as the flush draw gets there, as well as several straights. I check with intentions to call a bet. Phil checks. Alex checks back. I turn over the set, figuring it's got to be good when it checks through like that. It is. We win another pot. Our stack climbs to over 60,000. We're up more than 20,000 in a five-handed game with Ivy on our left. Here we pick up pocket fours on the button. Under the gun limps in for five. Under the gun plus one calls. I call. The small blind calls. The big blind checks. We're going five ways to the flop. It's queen jack four with two clubs. We've got bottom set on a coordinated board with multiple opponents. The first three players check. Under the gun plus one bets 20. There's too much going on with this board for me to flat with several opponents behind me. I raise to 65. The small blind, big blind, and under the gun all fold. Under the gun plus one isn't so quick to let go. He calls for 45 more. Maybe he has a queen or a flush draw. 
We're heads up. I'm rooting for a blank. The turn is the six of spades. That's a good one. The opponent checks. I want to try and get his whole stack, but I have no idea how much he's playing since his hands are blocking his chips from my view. This is when things really get interesting. Can I lift up your hands, please? I can't see, can't see how many chips you have. As the opponent lifts up his hands to about eye level, he holds onto his cards the entire time and briefly exposes what I see as a red face card. I don't see exactly what it is, but I feel really weird about the situation. I'm conflicted as to whether or not I should say something. I know that the opponent is likely drawing dead since he either has a queen or a jack, probably not both because he might have re-raised on the flop with top two pair on a draw heavy board. He could also have something like king 10, but he'll never have a flush draw. I have a huge hand and don't want to waste it by letting the opponent know that I have at least some clue as to the strength of what he's got. If another club comes out for instance, I can still value bet because I don't have to be worried about under the gun plus one having a flush. That's not how I want to be winning extra money, but at the same time, I did nothing wrong in this situation, and poker is a game about making the fewest mistakes. Him bringing his cards between a foot and a half to two feet off the table so that they're visible for everyone to see is a pretty big mistake. I bet 75 to ensure that I can get called from a queen, jack, or king 10. I didn't have to bet too much to protect against clubs. I strongly would have preferred him not to give me any information though. I feel very odd as the opponent calls. The river is the jack of spades giving us a full house. We either have top pair, trip jacks, or miss straight draw. There's some tiny chance that he has a better full house, but I almost completely ruled that out earlier. He checks and has 300 in his stack. I consider jamming, that's a little too greedy, and sometimes opponents are intimidated by the words all in. Instead, I bet 250, somewhat hoping for a fold. The opponent immediately calls, I turn over the full house, the player looks at his cards, part of me wants him to somehow have a better full house, he doesn't. He shows that he has jack-5 offsuit for trips. I'm not sure why he limped in with that hand, I have no idea why he called my raise on the flop, but I don't feel good about the situation. If I hadn't seen a card flash on the turn, I certainly would have bet larger than 75 to protect against flush draws, and maybe he would have folded at that point, rather than call and drill the worst river card in the deck for him. He can't fold to a large sizing once he makes trips. I don't really know what to do, my stack is up to 2700, I'm winning a few hundred on the night. I just don't feel right about it. Are you okay with being on the vlog? I have a YouTube channel. What's your name? Adam, I'm gonna give you uh, that last bet back, dude. There you go. Uh, I When you lifted up your hands, when I asked you to, I saw one of your cards. I, I didn't see exactly what it was, but I saw it was like a red face card. And it made me feel weird, so I just feel like you should have that back. I yeah. appreciate it, I'll take it. I yeah, yeah, it. good. In this one, we've got pocket fives in the small blind. A handful of players have left our table to play the uncapped 10-20 game that's just opened, including the player who just attempted the bluff against us. Some new players have arrived, including a player who straddles from under the gun. The middle position opponent limps in, the hijack calls for 20, we don't want to reopen the pot, and it's fine if we have more opponents, so I don't mind going multi-way. We call for 15 more, the big blind calls, he's a new player as well, the under the gun straddler needs to punish us limpers. He raises to 120. The middle position player calls for 100 more. It's too much for the hijack. He folds. I don't mind playing an inflated pot with a hand that'll be easy to play post flop. I call for 100 more. The big blind also calls. We're going four ways to the flop. Hit the like button on the count of three for some extra run good. Ready? One, two, three. The flop comes 5-5-3 five, five, with two hearts. Because of you, we flop quads in what's already a pretty big pot. I check, hoping someone has an overpair or is going to fire while drawing dead. The big blind checks. The under the gun straddler was the pre-flop raiser. He's our best candidate to take a shot. He bets 200. That'll be ours soon. The player in middle position has no regrets in life, except for entering this pot. He folds. There's no way that we'll be check raising on this street. I call to keep the bluffs in. The big blind folds. It's down to heads up. I'm rooting for a high card that'll give our opponent whatever he thinks he needs. Instead, the turn is the three of clubs. It's one of the worst cards that we could have gotten because it's really unlikely that our opponent has a three. In his mind, we could have one. Now that the board is double paired, if the opponent bets, a call from me will look incredibly suspicious. It won't look like I've got a flush draw. It'll look like I've got a boat or better. I check, someone expecting the turn card to freeze the opponent under the gun, isn't ready to give up just yet. He bets 400 and is 100% drawing dead now. The turn was a blank. I'd flat this bet with hopes of getting an opportunity to check jam the river. I think the river will check through at an extremely high percentage if I called though. 
No matter what I do, it'll be a tough task to get more money from the opponent. I raised to a thousand on this street to try and make it look like I'm bluffing with either a flush draw or maybe a straight draw. Ideally, this check raise would look odd and either induce a call from an overpair or even ace high or possibly induce a bluff shove. Maybe the plan is working out to perfection as the opponent asks to get a count on my stack. I think I have you covered. There's no better feeling in poker than when you have the nuts and the opponent is clearly considering jamming it on you while you know that he has zero outs. I suppose a slightly better feeling would be if he actually does jam on you. In this case, he folds. It's easy to beat myself up over that one and wish that I had called instead. Perhaps I pulled the trigger a little too early. Calling and then leading the river for a small or medium amount, almost regardless of the card, would have been a pretty interesting play too. It's not that often that I flop quads. We still win a good chunk to increase our profit to over 4,700. About a half hour in, we get an opportunity to get in the mix. By the way, there's at least one straddle on for every hand, so this one is 25, 50, 100. Doug has pocket jiggities and a second to act pre-flop. He raises to 250. We've got something that we'd like to play. We're in kind of early middle position with pocket sixes, this is a spot where the vast majority of players are going to flat the initial preflop raise with a small to medium pocket pair under these conditions. That's totally fine, but I've been doing some studying with Nick Petrangelo for part of the cash game course that's still going to be coming out on upswing. It's just been pushed back a few months and is scheduled to be released in the fall now. Anyway, here's a look at the preflop chart Petrangelo gave me for this exact situation. You'll notice that you're supposed to play a tight range since there are still several players left to act behind. It's mostly a three better fold strategy. Even with sixes, folding well over 50% of the time is the correct play, mixed in with some calls and some three bets that you see represented with the green. When I'm on stream, I try to take the more aggressive line as often as possible. The camera barely picks it up in the left of the screen, but I three bet to 700. It's not necessarily something that Doug or anyone else at the table would expect, and these guys are sharp guys. I need to do things that will occasionally catch people off guard in order to be successful at these stakes. Wow, Brad getting after it here, three bets to 700. Anybody want anything from the fridge? Owner-on-owner owner crime here. Partial owners of the club, Doug Polk, Brad Owen. That's okay. Doug makes the call, which he's supposed to do around 80% of the time because often I'll have at least two overs, if not an over pair. My three bet with sixes is just a low frequency play. Sometimes when you take a risk, you get punished, and sometimes you get rewarded. The flop comes 10-6 deuce rainbow, we've got a completely hidden middle set, and what's even better is that Doug has an overpair to the board. Doug checks, we've got the second best hand possible in what's becoming a large pot. I want to make sure that we're able to keep the opponent in with a wide variety of holdings and possibly induce a check raise. We down bet to 500 to make it very enticing to at least stick around with a call. This board won't always be great for my range, pretty regularly I'll just have an ace high type of hand that Doug may want to protect against. Doug just calls, which I anticipated him doing with lots of hands, so this doesn't help me narrow down his range too much. He could have a 10, maybe two overs with backdoor draws, maybe small or medium pocket pairs, and there's some small chance that he has jacks or queens, but those are discounted since he didn't 4-bet us pre-flop, which he'll do at least some percentage of the time, and he didn't check raise us on the flop, which he'll probably do some percentage of the time as well. The turn is the 3 of clubs, it's a sweet card because no additional hands are beating us that are plausible. If Doug has 3s, we might be able to get it all in. If he has fours or fives, we can probably get at least one more additional street of value. Hands like nines and eights won't be afraid of the three either. Doug checks again. We need to start building this pot up a little more. Ideally, we want to set ourselves up to get all the money in on or by the river. I bet 1200. It's slightly less than half the pot. Maybe it's on the small side considering what Doug has and what I just stated is our goal, but it makes it seem as if maybe I'm playing cautiously or afraid of something, and it again provides an opportunity for Doug to check raise us. The smaller we bet, the more hands opponents can check raise us with. Doug's going nowhere for that price. He calls. Now I'm beginning to think that queens and jacks are a lot more likely, given that Doug's made it all the way to the river after I 3-bet preflop, bet on the flop, and bet on the turn. I still wouldn't be too surprised to be up against ace-10 suited, nines, eights, sevens, fives, and fours. The river is the eight of hearts. I'm somewhat worried that we're up against a set of eights. Other than that, it's a great card. I don't have to be concerned that Doug will have 9-7 suited because he would have folded that at some point pre-flop. Doug checks. I want to target his queens, jacks, and ace-10 hands because he won't be calling a third barrel with many other combos. Over pairs and top pair hands should be able to call a fairly large bet. I consider shoving for around 8,000. I might do that as a bluff with a hand like Miss Clubs, ace-5 or ace-4. 
I just don't want to squander this opportunity to make at least some money and give Doug a chance to get away from something like an overpair, which he's definitely capable of folding if I jam. I announce about a 4,000. A quick 4,000. And see Brat, Doug's face, he's disgusted. He's got a bad feeling in his stomach, but I think he's going to lean on making the call, but what, what is really Brad doing this with? Is he really going to barrel three streets on me with a, a busted big slick, ace, queen, etc.? Queens plus have you beat. Tens, eights, possible sets. So Doug losing two a lot, and if anybody can make a good fold, it's the two seed. We've seen him do it. Vanessa, I mean, I mean Doug, is deep in the tank. He hates the spot that he's in. I'm glad to see him thinking hard about this one because this is the first moment that I 100% know that we've got the best hand. Despite being in a difficult situation, Doug is still cracking jokes. I be joining you on the stuck train here. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about boarding trains to Stuckville. Population one currently with McLovin in the nine seat buried 10K. Doug's travel plans sound amazing, but I'm doing my best to show no emotion. The longer that he contemplates what to do, the more likely it is that he has a top pair hand or an over pair. I know it, and Doug knows that I know it. You know what hand I have. It's your hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the jiggities. <laughs> Makes the call. The call. Shows wow. the set. And Brad Owen. Wow. Big pot. We get the call to win a huge pot against one of the main people who inspired me to make poker content on YouTube. I'd watched Doug and Jason Somerville for a long time before seeing Andrew and then eventually deciding to start my own channel. Studying Doug's Poker Lab course on upswing was also pivotal for my poker career, so while it's bittersweet to win against a friend at the table, this is a cool hand for me for multiple reasons. Shortly after we pick up pocket sevens on the button, under the gun plus one raises to 30. A player in middle position calls, the cutoff calls, I'd like to play. I call, the big blind calls, he was the opponent in the previous hand, we're going five ways to the flop, it comes queen seven five with two clubs, we have middle set and four opponents. Unfortunately, it checks to me. No one's seen any free cards, I bet 120. I chose the larger sizing since there are a couple draws out there, there are several opponents and I don't have a queen, someone or multiple people should be able to call a bet for that amount. It's too bad for us, we don't get a call. Something better happens. The big blind puts in a check raise to 300. This is such a good spot to be in because this player didn't 3-bet preflop like I imagine he would with pocket queens. His range is capped at a set of fives or a two pair hand at best. It folds back to me, we're playing deep stack poker, I've got a decision to make. Do I flat, hoping that the turn is a blank in order to make my move then? The risk with this option is that the turn could be something like the eight of clubs, which might either give my opponent the lead, or if he has two pair or a set of fives, it could freeze him and make it so that he's no longer willing to put in as much money. If I raise right now, it could scare him off either a one pair hand like king queen or a semi bluff. I fight off my urge to pile in money. Instead, I take the patient approach, calling for 180 more. The turn is the jack of hearts. It's great because we still have what's essentially the nut since the opponent will never have turned a set. I'm expecting to see a big bet from him. Surprisingly, he bets 300 again. I don't know what hand it makes sense for the big blind to bet this amount with. Maybe he just wanted to see where he was at on the flop with a one pair hand like king queen or queen 10, and now that he's gotten called, he doesn't know what to do and is trying to get to showdown cheaply. I'm no longer going to wait around though, the time is now to make a move. I raised to 800. This should look odd since I didn't put in a third bet on the flop, a jack comes out, I faced a small bet, and suddenly I want to raise to play a massive pot. It might look like I'm trying to pull off a bluff with some sort of draw. If he somehow has a better set, that's just unlucky for me. I'm never folding to a shove, even though it'd be for piles. The big blind eventually comes to his decision. Right. Once, twice. Up to you. Cody, time. We're in a pot well over $4,000 with a set on a very draw heavy board and we're running it twice. If I win this, I'll be up $3,500. If I lose, I'll once again be stuck for the day and I won't have any energy to keep playing after a long session of battling. I'll have to book a loss. Everything comes down to two river cards. The first one is the four of spades. At least no club gets there, but eight six makes it straight. The second river is the four of hearts. Basically the only hand that I'm worried about being up against is eight six of clubs. Guess what we're up against? The opponent has ace six of clubs. He bricked the ace high flush. 
We win both runouts for the biggest pot that I've won in months. Waiting until the turn to raise pays off huge. Not only do we stack the opponent for a ton of chips, but it's possible that we could have gotten it in against him on the flop, and if we ran it twice at that point, he potentially could have made a straight or a flush on the second run out since we would have seen one more card come out. Sometimes it's tough to battle back from being down 1500. Not only did we recoup that amount, with this enormous pot coming towards us, we're up 3500. It's been a $5,000 swing in our direction. This is the most money that I've had in front of me in a 510 game at Bellagio ever. The very next hand we're dealt pocket eights on the button. The nemesis who shoved on us the previous two hands we've gone over completely disregards my advice to run and hide. He limps in from under the gun plus one. The cutoff raises to 40. I call. The action's on the big blind who slow rolled me earlier. We've already determined that he doesn't like the amount 40. He does what he wants. Depending. No, we get a... <laughs> it's four of those. It's four, four of those. Really? Four. Easy, 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 please, easy. <laughs> Please. Yeah, boy. We've got quite the cast of characters here. I feel like we're in poker's version of SNL's Jeopardy, and the big blind is Sean Connery. Under the gun plus one calls, so both players that I have to get revenge on are in there. We're going four ways to the flop in position. The big blind emphatically checks dark. The dealer puts out king eight six with two clubs. We flop middle set in a multi-way pot. Under the gun plus one checks. The cutoff checks. This is such a great situation. I bet 110. The big blind gets the chip denominations wrong, but ultimately gets the right amount out there, and he does it just for me. One, one ten. Just for the blue eye. The other player that I need to crush, Min raises the 220, is the second hand in a row that he's raised me on the flop, and the third time in the last 15 minutes, the cutoff folds. I'm gonna try and get as much money in now as possible. I re-raised to 500. The big blind isn't afraid, he makes the call. Under the gun plus one only has 640 total, yet he calls as well and leaves himself with 140 behind. This is already a massive pot. There are so many cards that I won't be happy to see. The eight of hearts is not one of them. We drill quads with piles of money in the middle. Both players are likely drawing dead. The big blind checks. Under the gun plus one jams for his remaining 140. This actually puts me in kind of a weird spot. I want to extract as much money as I can out of the big blind since he has about 1350 in his stack, but I don't want to raise so much that he folds. In a multi-way pot, after I three bet on the flop and put in a raise on the turn when someone has already shoved, my line is going to look a lot like I have a boat. So I'd expect the big blind to fold to larger sizings, knowing that if he has ace five of clubs, for instance, that he likely won't have any outs. I grab my yellow bird to release it back in the wild where it belongs, but I only bet 500 of it to milk him, build up a side pot, and entice a call or potentially a bluff if the big blind decides a trip eights is a good hand for him to rep. The opponent slides in a call. There's a significant side pot that takes some time for the dealer to sort out. I suppose there's a tiny chance that the big blind has a king. There's a much better chance that he has clubs. I'm rooting for one on the river. The dealer puts out the seven of hearts. The entire pot is going to us eventually. It's just a matter of whether or not the rest of the big blind stack will be included in it. He checks. I've only got one move that makes sense. I shove for 850 effective. The big blind must have had a draw. He almost immediately folds. We turn over the quads. I'm excited to show everybody and win the pot, especially since things haven't been going particularly well for me over the previous 10 sessions or so. Looks like we're back to moving in the right direction and the other players at the table are very cool about it. You got two pairs, eight and eight. Two pairs. <laughs> That's damn good hand. I like that hand. The yellow bird is returned to us, and the rest of the chips in the middle follow soon after. The sweet old man didn't run and hide. My patience to wait for a better spot pays off. It's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but we're up about 2,500 on the session. At least we're up about 1,700 on the day when we pick out pocket nines in the cutoff. A few more pros have entered the game to replace some of the recreational players, so it's not quite as good as it was at first. I raised to 100. One of those new pros, three bets to 460, which isn't very nice of him. It's a large sizing. Still, we're both deep. If we can flop a set, maybe we can win a big one. I call for 360 more. We're heads up in position. The dealer puts out 1093 with two spades. We've got middle set on a coordinated board. I'm trying to contain my excitement as the opponent reaches for chips. He down bets at 360. I'm debating whether or not we should make our move now. We don't want to see any spade or really any overcard to the board because they'll either complete possible straight draws, potentially give my opponent a higher set, possibly scare my opponent from wanting to put more money in the pot if he has queens for example and an ace or king comes out. It's best to try and get as much money in now as possible. I raise to a thousand. The opponent doesn't appear to be considering a fold. It looks like he's either going to call or raise. I wouldn't be able to get my chips in fast enough if he does raise. If he has a set of tens, it's just not our day. The big blind calls. 
probably has some type of strong draw or an overpair. The turn is the eight of diamonds, queen jack, jack seven, and seven six make a straight. The big blind checks. Despite our hand being downgraded, we can't allow the opponent to see a free card. I'm sticking with our plan to target overpairs and big flush draws. I increased the bet sizing to 3,000. I don't exactly want to get jammed on, but we'll certainly be calling a shove if the opponent rips it. Instead, he calls. If he had us beat, he would have gotten it all in by now. The fact that he didn't makes me very confident that we've got the best hand. The only holding that I could see the opponent playing the same way up to this point that beats us is exactly Queen Jack of Spades. Even then, I still think he probably would have shoved the turn. The river is the six of clubs putting four to the straight on board. This has become a huge pot. We have $7,010 behind. The big blind checks. It's not likely that the opponent has a seven in his hand. and We've already ruled out a set of tens in most queen jack combinations. Even with four to the straight on board, by process of elimination, I'm confident that we've got the winner. If we want to bet, our best option is to shove. The opponent could still possibly call us with any overpair if he thinks that we're bluffing with a missed draw like King Jack or missed flush draw. Earlier on in my poker career, I'd occasionally play scared and check back a hand like this one on this board. Not anymore. I jam for over $7,000. If we get called, this will be a $23,000 pot, which would be the biggest pot that I've ever played at Bellagio. We don't get snapped, so I'm feeling better and better about the situation. The big blind is perplexed. He isn't sure if I'm bluffing or not. The nuts have drastically changed since the flop came out, yet here I am, firing big on all three streets, saying that I'm not afraid to play for stacks. The big blind puts in a handful of yellow calling chips, we excitedly turn over our middle set, it's good, we get the absolute maximum to win the biggest pot that we've ever won at this property. There's no better feeling in poker than using all the information available to you to make the most money possible. After we get a count of the chips, the entire pot comes our way, the pro who we got is steaming and immediately picks up the scraps that he has remaining. We're up 13,000 on the session. If we left right now, it'd be my second biggest win ever, but we're not leaving. Almost an hour into the third level, we pick up pocket tens under the gun. With blinds of 50,000, 75,000, I raised to 150,000. Pat Lyons is a new arrival at the table. If you don't know who Pat Lyons is, he's more than happy to tell you and everyone within earshot that he's the world famous Pat Lyons. Here's his Twitter profile. To his credit, he's probably the absolute most famous person that I've ever met with less than 1,941 Twitter followers. Perhaps regionally famous Pat Lyons is a more appropriate title, with that region being just in his head. But he has won a bracelet event and also a WPT main event. He's another wild opponent and he three bets to 550,000 for middle position. This is the second time he's done this in the last few minutes. I'm beginning to suspect that he doesn't always have it. Pat's stack is about 40 big blinds. We've got him covered. I'm tempted to rip it since there are only four better pocket pairs than ours. If we don't hit a set, we won't like most flops. Despite us possibly having the best hand if we're up against ace-king, ace-queen, more bluff type combos, I flat to preserve our stack in case we're behind and see a flop. The dealer puts out 9-3 deuce with two clubs. There are no overcards out there and it's unlikely that we're up against a set of nines. This is one of the best flops that we could have gotten without improving. I check to see how Pat wants to play this. The boisterous opponent puts out a big bet of 800,000, leaving himself with only 1,750,000 behind. This is a brutal spot for us. If we call, we may not want to see any clubs on the turn. Despite having the 10 of clubs, we certainly won't want to see any ace, king, queen, or jack either. That's a lot of cards that we'd have to fade. A call would put the pot at 2.9 million, and Pat would have barely more than half a pot size bet remaining in his stack. It seems like we have to either fold an overpair on the flop to an eccentric dude for a bet of two-thirds pot or get it in right now for 2.5 million effective. I'm handcuffed and I hate both options. Ultimately, I rip it for 2,550,000 effective. We've got the opponent cover to be called, so even if we lose, we'll have 11 big blinds. Pat snap calls and couldn't be happier to show pocket kings. The locally, sometimes recognized opponent has me absolutely crushed. To make things worse, He's got the king of clubs, so we don't have the backdoor flush to fall back on. This is just another cooler situation. We've had two go our way so far. It was just a matter of time before one went the other way. The turn is the jack of clubs. We pick up the flush draw, but it makes no difference since Pat has a better one. We're down to two possible outs and a pot for over six million in chips. We'll either be one of the chip leaders with 70 remaining, or we'll be left with scraps. Sometimes, it's just your tournament. Wow! Holy Fucking shit. ass, damn it, man. Fucking damn it. Fuck. Fucking damn it. I haven't covered. I'm not sure there's much we could have done differently in that spot. 
We both had over pairs, so it pretty much played itself, but we get as lucky as possible to put a world famous beat on the opponent for a pot worth over $600,000 in buy-in money to knock out our first victim of the day. We're running as hot as possible in every important hand. I'm not a particularly religious or spiritual person, but it's hard not to feel like I'm getting some help from my dad in a few of these spots. From time to time throughout the tournament, I'll think about him and wish that he could have stuck around a little longer to see runs like these. Getting lucky isn't exactly how I want to win, but I've been on the losing end of plenty of these in important spots in other tournaments. Now that I'm on the right side, I'm going to do my best to make the most of it. We pick up pocket jiggities in the big blind about half past midnight. Under the gun plus one takes a gander at his cards. He likes them, just not enough to raise this time. He limps in for 40. The player on his left is next to act. He raises to 200, presumably to isolate the limper. This hand is set up somewhat similarly to the pocket tens hand when I got 4-bet jammed on for piles. Effective stacks are slightly deeper in this one, making it less likely that someone would rip it on us if I re-raise. I 3-bet to 800 to let people know what's up. Under the gun plus 1 gets the hint that he doesn't have the best hand. He folds. Under the gun plus 2 isn't quick to make a decision. A fold from him would be fine. Instead, he 4-bets at 2400. It's another awkward spot for me. Should I call this bet for 1600 more? Should I fold? Should I jam? Guys, don't get too hung up about the correct decision. There's no right way to play this hand. It doesn't matter. I call for 1600 more, knowing that almost all the flops are going to be difficult to navigate. We're heads up out of position with 5k in the middle. The dealer puts out 1065 with two spades. Is it a good one for us? No way to really know. Maybe we're ahead of our opponent's ace king. Maybe we're in terrible shape. I check to the preflop aggressor. I imagine that he'll be betting whatever two cards that he's got. Stack to pot ratio is just over one. The opponent significantly down bets at 1600. We don't have a spade in our hand. There's only one great turn card for us. The board is likely only going to get worse. For that reason, I'm inclined to jam, but I'll probably only get called by over pairs or ace king or ace queen of spades, which is doing pretty well against our pair anyway. I'm just going to take this one street at a time and try not to worry too much about what will happen in the future. I call, leaving myself with 47.20. We're in a pot approaching five-figure territory. It's massive. The turn is the seven of diamonds, putting another flush draw on the board. I check. Just maybe, the opponent will check back and give up with an ace-king type of hand. It's extremely tense. Under the gun plus two is soaking as much airtime as possible while he decides whether or not he wants to jam or see a free river card. My hand is basically face up, I'll occasionally have pocket tens, sometimes I'll have aces or ace kings suited, but mostly I'll have queens and jacks. The opponent is a good player who knows the types of hands that I'll have, yet he grabs a 5k flag and slowly places it in front of him, it's a bet that has me barely covered. There aren't that many combos that I'm beating, the opponent's range only consists of semi bluffs and hands that have me drawing to two outs. The main thing I'm considering is how big the pot is compared to my stack. I'm getting nearly 3 to 1 on a call. The opponent has no repair to my jacks, I can live with getting stacked that way. I'll chalk it up to a cooler. I toss in a calling chip. The opponent isn't exactly overjoyed, but I still don't know if we're ahead or not. Um, you. Um, let's see here. The opponent has ace king of spades. I'm thrilled to see that we got it in good, but we're not out of the woods yet. The opponent can hit one of nine spades or six cards that'll give him a better pair. He's going to win this 34% of the time. It's a pot of almost $18,000. It's the biggest cash game pot that I've played in a while. And I've got 100% of myself with a big decision to make. Ultimately, I'm not here to chop pots. I'm here to win. Let's just go once. It's better for the vlog. We're going one time for everything. We're either going to win a massive pot to be up several thousand or we're going to get stacked. It's all coming down to one card, the river, is the deuce of clubs. It makes my heart sink to my stomach for a second before I'm able to process that it's not a spade. Running it once pays off big time. It's the largest pot that I've ever won at win. We get a full double up from a talented player. The table won't let me get away with taking down the pot without cracking some jokes. Good call, sir. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe that hand isn't so bad after all. We somehow managed to get a fantastic run out and make the maximum after being a slight underdog on the flop and a decent favorite on the turn. It's time for another bomb pot. Every player puts in $100 each. We're playing seven handed at the moment. If we win, we'll have gotten all the way out of the $6,400 hole that we were in. We look down at pocket queens in the big blind. 
It's normally one of the worst times to pick up a premium pocket pair because, like I said earlier, one pair of hands rarely win at showdown in bomb pots when there are so many opponents, so you typically have to improve to two pair better. And we do. The dealer puts out queen queen nine rainbow, we flop quads with 700 in the middle, and not a damn worry in the world. I've never had quads in a bomb pot before, certainly not during a high stakes session. The only concern of mine is how are we possibly going to get paid when we've got everything. Small blind checks, there's no way that we'll be betting when I'm second to act and all the queens are accounted for. I check, hoping someone will get out of line. No one bites, it checks around. The turn is the eight of spades at least putting a flush draw on the board and completing a possible straight. Small blind checks, I'm a patient guy, I can't let this check through again though, I make a small bet of 200 to get things going. I wouldn't be too surprised if this folds around, I actually think it's the most likely outcome. All hope isn't lost, Rob takes two black chips from his stack and calls in middle position, the hijack and cutoff fold, the button, who we've tangled with multiple times is considering his options, I told you earlier he makes aggressive plays at strange times, this would be amazing if he raised here, I don't want to do anything that might tip him off that we've got the absolute nuts, still, in my head I'm thinking, please do something wild. He comes through and raises to 1100. This seems like a bluff since we've got all the queens. I don't know if he'd raise with a straight on this board, or maybe he has nines full or eights full. The small blind folds. I was originally thinking that I may not get any customers with my $200 bet. Now that I've gotten called and then raised, I'm thinking about the best way to stack one, or maybe even two players. There's no reason to risk scaring anyone off. We don't need to re-raise for protection. I flat the 1100. Rob can't justify calling for 900 more. He folds, it's down to heads up with a guy who I know is capable of taking huge risks if he sees an opportunity to win a pot. It's the perfect setup. The river is the seven of clubs. It doesn't change much since Jack-10 was already a straight. The button has exactly 5,000 left in his stack. We have him covered. The pot is only 3,100, so it could be tough to get everything. I don't want to risk this checking through since it's highly likely that the opponent is bluffing and may shut down after I called his raise on the turn with another player behind me. I put out a fake blocker bet of 600 to appear as if I'm weak and trying to get to showdown cheaply. I've already seen multiple times today, including earlier in this hand, that the opponent has no aversion to raising. We just need him to take the bait here. If he has air like a missed flush draw, he may make a last ditch effort to try and steal the pot after seeing a weak looking bet. If he has a really strong hand like a full house, or possibly even a straight, he'll probably think that I have trick queens and he can raise for value. Almost no matter what he has, he'll feel some inclination to make it more. He takes the black chips that he's shuffling in his hand, adds it to a much larger stack of black chips, and then raises to 2600. I don't play these stakes that often, it's tough to flop quads, and even more rare to get raised twice in the same hand while having the absolute nuts. This is an unbelievable feeling. Let's just take a second to enjoy this and hit the like and subscribe buttons. We've made the maximum. Yes, the button still has another 2400 in his stack, but there's no way that he can call a shove even if he has pocket nines for what we know is the second nuts because it's too likely that I'll have queen nine, queen eight, or queen seven for a better full house and I wouldn't bluff or re-raise with anything worse. Still, we have to go for it. I put in the inevitable all-in re-raise for 5000 effective. The button can't believe it. He must not have been raising as a bluff on the river because he doesn't snap fold. I get the sense that he knows he's beat. He's got to see it though. He tosses in a calling chip. We've officially made the most that we could possibly make. We never find out what the opponent had. It must have been either Jack-10, Pocket 9s, or Pocket 8s. They're all pretty similar in this instance because they don't beat the hands that I'm representing. It's an insane $13,000 pod that comes our way. Earlier on, it seemed like I was destined to lose every chip that I had in front of me. I was stuck several thousand dollars and a favored to be down 10,000. We got some magic in two separate hands with pocket queens to now be up 6,000 on the session. The day is completely turned around. It isn't over either. About 10 minutes in, I'm still getting situated and we pick up pocket kings on the button. At least I think I'm the button because we see that big button looking thing in the top left. That's actually the bomb pot button. I'm in the small blind. With the session just starting, me playing in a big game, getting pocket kings and trying to get the camera set up all at once, I'm a little distracted. Under the gun plus one raises to 55. 
I played with his opponent the day before and know that he's a wild guy. He also knocked Doug out of the main event a few days prior after calling a 3-bet with 8-3 offsuit and flopping trips. I must avenge Doug. I 3-bet to 160. I would have made it 200 if I had realized that I'd be playing this from out of position. The opponent calls, we're going heads up to the flop, it's reminiscent of what the judges gave me for my mime act during my high school talent show. That's right, all 10s. The act was sick, I was in a box and everything. We flop an interesting full house. If my opponent has a pocket pair below 10s, he's drawing dead to run a runner perfect. I down bet to 125 in order to string the opponent along as if I'm walking the dog with a yo-yo. The opponent complies and makes the call. I'm already trying to think about how I can extract maximum value throughout the rest of the hand. The turn is the six of diamonds. It's a great card. I don't want to see anything above a 10 come out, not even a king. I increase my sizing to 475. Under the gun plus one isn't deterred by my bet. Only about 10 seconds go by before he calls. As we're getting further into this hand, I'm suspecting more and more that my opponent has exactly queens or jacks. Or, you know, quads. If he flopped quads and I get stacked, I can live with that though. The river is the four of clubs. It's another card that doesn't change a damn thing. The dealer could have just put his business card out there instead. I'm going to bet, and I'm going to bet big to target worse pocket pairs. I make it 1500 I actually wouldn't have minded jamming for about 3300 total. You can't really fold queens for that amount since that's the second best hand that I'll ever have other than four tens. Under the gun plus one is clearly distraught at the moment. He's not sure what to do. He has no phone a friend lifeline at his disposal. I'm rooting hard for a call, but maybe 1500 was a bit too greedy. Maybe it wasn't greedy enough. The opponent matches the bet. We show him the two cowboys. They're more than good. We never find out what under the gun plus one has as his cards are returned to the dealer face down. We're up over 2,000 immediately. We win back more from the opponent than he got from Doug's tournament buy-in. Doug has been completely avenged. It seems like we're up a lot. After all, it's an amount more than 200 big blinds. We've got pocket aces again. This time we're on the button. I three bet to 1,500. There's no nick game going on or anything like that. Alex just has a hand that he wants to play. He's tired of me three and four betting people. He puts in the cold four bet himself to 4,800. Andrew folds immediately. There are a couple of graphical errors in this hand. The first one is that it says Alex only four bet to 3,800, which is incorrect. As we can see, there are four yellow 1K chips out there, a purple $500 chip, and three black $100 chips. Also, his stack is incorrect. It says Alex started the hand with 38,000, but he has four pink 5K chips, around 15 1K chips, 12K in black, another 5K or so in purples, and 1,600 in green. Altogether, he has somewhere around 53,000 total to start. We've got him covered. I want to get as much in now as possible. I 5 bet to 11,000. Perhaps the 4 bet from me earlier is still in Alex's mind, but I had aces against him in that hand too. He might be thinking that I can't always be strong, though I have been today against him. Alex calls for 5,200 more. We're heads up in position in a 5 bet pot with the opponent completely dominated. The flop comes 10-7-4 with two clubs. It's close to as bad as it could get. The opponent checks. The main hands that I put my opponent on are pocket kings and queens, ace-king, maybe ace-queen suited. I'm not too thrilled when I look down to realize that we don't have the ace of clubs. It makes it a lot more likely that our opponent could have a flush draw. Because of that, we're not going to be down betting. I bet 13,000 in an attempt to get all the chips in the middle right now. I don't expect to be up against pocket 10s very often. I'm rooting for a jam so that I can call. Alex actually has about 42,000 total. He's got one of the best poker faces in the game. He gets a count of his inventory. In my head, I'm repeating the same monologue over and over. Rip it, dude. Rip it. After almost exactly a minute, Alex comes to a decision. All in announced from Alex, a snap call from Brad. I see Alex's cards, and it's about the worst case scenario I could have imagined. The best case scenario would have been pocket kings, ideally with no club. Ace king or ace queen of clubs would have been better as well, but now we're playing a pot that's over $100,000, and my opponent can hit any club or a 10 to win. I've gone through so much pain in this new studio, I haven't won a single all-in outright with cards to come, even though I've played multiple huge all-ins, They've just all gone the other way. Despite that, I want to make sure that we're not chopping this. We're either going to have max joy or absolute max pain. Come on, Brad. Whatever you want. I just go once. And Brad wants to go once for blood. I got in a large deficit early. I got all the way out of it to be up 20,000, only to put it all on the line here with just a 57% chance of winning. 
I'll either be up 70,000 on the day or I'll be down about 40,000 to book another massive loss in this room. I can barely stand to look at the run out, though I'm in the eight seat and I'm the first player at the table to see the cards as they come out. The turn is the seven of diamonds. I'm still not able to breathe properly as I'm getting the sense that this is just being set up for me to experience ultimate agony when a club comes on the river. Each second feels like an eternity. I wanna see a red card so badly just so that I don't have to sweat as much. I'm not sure what I did to deserve it, but I see the five of clubs here before everyone else and my heart completely stops. This is one more massive loss of mine that everyone will be talking about all over social media. It's one more time that I'll leave Austin with less than I came in with. One more time, I'll have to explain to family and friends that they don't need to worry about me and everything's okay. Except, this time is different because it's the five of spades that comes out. We win a pot over $100,000 to be up, way more than I've ever been up in a session before. I was so mentally prepared to see a club that it took me a long time to realize that it's a spade that the dealer actually put out. It's not quite the biggest pot that I've ever won. It's certainly the most satisfying just because of everything that's led up to it for me. I needed a win to restore some confidence and have some good memories in this room. We get a count of both of our chips just to make sure that I have them covered, and I do. Shortly into the session, my name is at the bottom of the leaderboard, but it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. We're up at the top of the leaderboard now with a stack over $100,000. We actually have quite a bit more than what's listed. We've got closer to $120,000, and I'm up $70,000 on the session. It's been a great day.